I'm very happy to start uh, our last uh, panel. Um, this panel will be dealing with the uh, WMD free zone in the Middle East and uh, will present some local initiatives. Um, we'll start with Sharon, uh, which uh, I'm very lucky to be a partner of in the Israeli disarmament movement. And we'll have her now. Thank you, Nadav, and this is a very good opportunity to present Nadav Sheltiel, my partner in the movement. Uh, he was away uh, uh, last week, and I don't know who missed him more, his wife or me. We're still arguing about it. Um, I'll try to be very, very short, and I think that uh, most of the people sitting here already know most of it, so I'll be so brief. Uh, if you need me to, to stop on something, just maybe, ki or, or elaborate more about something, just uh, keep it for the questions. Is that okay? So I can run forward. Um, as some of you or all of you know, the discourse about the WMD, meaning weapons of mass destruction, WMD free zone in the Middle East uh, started uh, mainly at the 1970s um, around the, the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, when, when states are called for a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. The discourse continued. Uh, there were lots of milestones in this, in this uh, discourse. Uh, one thing that happened throughout the history of the discourse uh, and never changed was the lack of Israeli participancy in this discourse. I mean, while uh, at several points in history, all the states that are signatory to one of those treaties agreed uh, unilaterally, including the United States, that there should be some work towards a WMD free zone in the Middle East. One state didn't, didn't change its discourse or lack of discourse. One state didn't participate in any of the conversation, and that was, of course, Israel. Uh, in 2010, at the review conference, of the non-proliferation treaty, the one, one of the decisions, there's a 64 uh, points uh, that were made in 2010, one of them called for an international uh, conference um, in, in, in the auspices of the UN, um, Russia, England, and the United States uh, to be held uh, that was decided later, but that's not that important, uh, to be held in Helsinki uh, with a facilitator that is the under, under uh, secretary for, uh, or minister uh, of foreign affairs. His name is Yakov Laiova. Um, and that conference was supposed to take place till the end of 2012. Uh, you haven't heard about it. Uh, you haven't heard that it happened. The reasons that Israelis didn't heard about um, about this conference is A, because it didn't happen, and second, because even if it would have happened, probably we wouldn't hear about it because we simply don't read or write or, or hear about any of this discourse. It just don't exist here. Um, I said something at the beginning of the day um, about, about out of 120 members of parliament, maybe there's one or two members of parliament that know, knew about it then, and that because one of those parliamentarians is the prime minister and he knew about it. Uh, but but there, were no, there was no discourse. Not the question whether we should, uh, we should be part of this um, conference. What are the implications if Israel won't be part of this conference? And so on. In Israel, or in other places, they like to call it business as usual. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, can we continue with this business of usual? Is the policy, the Israel policy, or lack of policy in some ways, I mean, I know that, that, that it sounds weird, but I, I'm sure that some of it is total lack of policy that worked for 40 years can still work now. And the answer is no. Because if Israel won't join these talks, if these talks won't take place, and there are rumors that they maybe will take place, but if these talks won't take place before the next a non-proliferation treaty review conference that will start in April 2015, this time there might be implications because the Arab states 
the non-aligned movements, which have over 100 states, will not sit still and let it continue. There will be uh, steps taken by them. What are the steps? We can't know. We don't know, but we can imagine. And if we'll go for the worst case scenario, maybe we're looking at some of the Arab states leaving that non-proliferation treaty. Is that a possibility? Of course it is. What does it mean if we'll take two, two worst case scenarios uh, two worst-case scenarios at the same time and look at them in a responsible way, not in a panicky way. Just look at two possibilities. What happened if the Arab states, or some of them, leave the non-proliferation treaty and don't see themselves a uh, part of this regime anymore? And what happened if these states have uh, nuclear facilities, just like Jordan is about to have, the, the Emirates are about to have, Egypt has, um, uh, the, the Saudis that maybe don't have the facilities but have a very nice agreement with the Pakistanis, meaning that they can buy ready nuclear weapons from the Pakistanis, and Pakistan has nuclear weapons and is not part of the non-proliferation treaty, just like Israel, so there's no problem for the Pakistanis to have such deals. If we're looking at all that, and we, are, we understand that for the first time we are at a crossroad that might change the whole Middle East. Is this still, if we're looking just on, on, just from the point of security, is this still a, a, a place for Israel to continue with the, we're not talking about it, not thinking about it, not discussing it, and our members of parliament feel that it's still not the, none of their business? I don't think that we can continue exactly like that. I mean, this is not the reality we live in anymore. So, if we're looking at reasons for disarmament from all WMDs, from all weapons of mass destruction, we can look at one thing, is that we're looking at a future that has or might have a possibility of a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Not safe for anyone. Talking about Middle East with weapons of mass destruction means something else. Even if we believe that states are responsible enough not to use nuclear or nuclear weapons or any other weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons or biological weapons, we are also looking at non-state parties, or to be more specific, terror organization, and to be even more specific, ISIS, for example, and Paul, you just wrote about the possibility that ISIS has or, get, or have the ability to get some old Iraqi chemical weapons. There were already pictures of, co of, of Kurdish soldiers with what seemed to be, a, that, that seemed to be killed by a mustard a, agent. I mean, we, we already see the possibilities. There's only one way to make sure that weapons of mass destruction won't fall to the hands of terror organizations, and that's not to have them. And just to remind you, terror organizations are not states. They can use weapons of mass destruction because we cannot use weapons of mass destruction back at them. It's simply impossible. When you look at weapons of mass destruction, and I'm saying it mainly for, for those Israelis who haven't dealt with this topic again. We need to remember that this weapon is a non-discriminatory weapon, a weapon that uh, has no boundary. You cannot use a nuclear weapon, chemical weapon, or biological weapon and expect it to stay at the borders of the state that you used it against it because it simply doesn't work like that. But I think that there's one more important thing even for Israelis, when we're looking at these weapons, and I know that this might sound naive to most uh, states, oh, to, to, sorry, to most Israelis, but this weapon is simply not moral. We probably possess all three kinds of weapons of mass destruction, and as a society, we have never stopped thinking who these weapons are aimed for. This is not a weapon that we are aiming or thinking of using against armies. When we're talking about weapons of mass destruction, this is a weapon that aimed at civilians. This is a weapon that's supposed to destroy cities because it will not, discrimi it, it will not discriminate and it will harm mainly civilians. We asked 
for this panel, and we asked for this occasion to happen um, for, for mainly civil society today, because we strongly believe in the role of civil society when it comes to new and uh, creative ways to get us out of this frozen state that, we're, uh, th that we have been living uh, in, in the last uh, years when it comes to this discourse. I had the privilege to go to several meetings of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the, and the Chemical Weapons Conventions, and what you see there is state after state reading statements. Mostly st statements that have been worked for months before, and sometimes when I'm looking at these people reading statements, I imagine them sitting with cement, uh, suit, uh, cement uh, uh, clothes. They can't really move. They can't really think creatively. They don't have the possibility because they have so many constructions before they write a statement. And they cannot engage in real discourse, in a creative discourse. And this is something that we have to do. We have the luxury of not knowing. Lots of times it's really good. We are not part of all these secret talks. We don't know what didn't work in the past, and we are not clinging to everything that doesn't work. We are positive people. That's why we are in the civil society, and that's why we are activists, and we are looking in a creative way for path forward. And this is uh, our uh, responsibility, too. Weapons of mass destruction didn't aim to harm armies. It, harm, it, it aimed to harm us civilians, and it's up to us civilians to do something about it. And, the, and, and this responsibility is even stronger when it comes to Israel, a state that probably possesses all three weapons, and probably, uh, and probably will try to continue not to talk about all three uh, weapons. One of the things that Paul and I uh, were, were talked about uh, yesterday when we were fantasizing about what can we do, one of the things that we thought was one letter uh, signed with civil society organizations from Israel and outside of Israel. We thought that together we can maybe find even 200 organizations calling for Israel as a first step to ratify the Chemical Weapons Convention. But one thing I wouldn't do, not at this point, is to try to connect it with Egypt ratifying and signing the CWC. Simply because, as civil society, it's not our job to call on Egypt to do that. Civil society in Israel. Because we know the reality. I mean, we're not hung into what is right to say. We're hung on what might work or that's at least what we should. As far as I understand, the, Amer the, the Egyptian refusal to sign and ratify the CWC has nothing to do with the Israeli uh, alleged or not alleged arsenal of chemical weapons. It has any connection to do with a nuclear weapon uh, arsenal. And therefore, if we want to continue, we have to show the first step, and the first step is Israel, to ratify the CWC. And we, we can do it very safely because we still have nuclear weapons and biological weapons that keep us so safe. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is someone we consider as an asset for the Israeli disarmament movement and for Israel. Uh, he's a private lawyer uh, working on human rights and on the armed trade. Uh, is also a, a co-host uh, in our weekly radio show at the All for Peace radio. Um, his name is Itai Mek, and I'll give him the floor now. So now you, you made me nervous. <laughs> so I was uh, not at all. So we, we, again, uh, we start from the beginning. We talked before about uh, the incentive, the rational incentive for Israel to join the CWC. The way I analyze it, uh, Israel have uh, three main principal uh, concerns that we have to keep it in mind. The first is that Israel co connects the air position uh, of, this, of the chemical weapon with their nuclear uh, uh, weapon arsenal. And it can't be separated. This is Israel's uh, uh, position. Uh, the second is that Israel main part of its uh, security uh, uh, strategy is, is the deterrence, to keep its, uh, its uh, WMD uh, obscure, not to tell it what, what uh, it got or, or, or don't got, or don't have. 
Uh, and this means that Israel don't want uh, any kind of uh, international inspector to come uh, to, to Israel to, to check uh, whatever. The third thing, and, and we see it in, especially in the last decade, is that Israel, the, the political and military establishment, feels that Israel is, is, a, is a country under siege. And we see that Israel uh, don't want to ratify uh, many important uh, international conventions. For example, a few months ago, Israel declared that it won't ratify the Arms Trade Treaty. Israel didn't ratify the ICC con the convention, the Rome Convention. Israel also, uh, for uh, decades, keep telling to, to, the, to come to the court, the Israeli state attorney keep saying that the Geneva Convention don't apply in the occupied territory, but Israel uh, is ready to, to, uh, to uh, uh, be obliged to the humanitarian article in Geneva Convention voluntarily. Uh, part of it is because Israel wants some flexibility in the international arena, uh, but another, another uh, reason is because Israel don't want, uh, is afraid that other countries might uh, abuse the, the international uh, arrangement against Israel. Uh, for my opinion, if Israel uh, would have, uh, uh, would have uh, need to ratify the Genocide Convention or the Refugee uh, Convention that it ratified in the 50s, it would never do, do it this year, these days. Because it, it, it's not because Israel would be, is planning to do a genocide, but it, it wouldn't want uh, anybody to, to abuse this uh, convention and say, ah, Israel is doing a genocide in the West Bank or, or whatever. Uh, so this is very important three uh, reasons, principal reason that we have to, to deal with them. Uh, if I look on Israel's position concerning the CWC, and the chemical uh, uh, weapon in the last 20 years, it haven't changed much. Like if you take, I know, I don't know what is what Israel representative uh, saying clo behind closed doors to the OPCW uh, 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 organization, but I know all the public statement and I wrote a, a brief of Israel statement uh, in Hebrew. Uh, Israel position is, is about three points. Fer the first one is that Israel uh, never admitted that he, that, uh, he developed uh, or, or possessed a chemical weapon. The second is that Israel support the CWC and see it as a good thing to the world and support the destruction of uh, the chemical uh, weapon all worldwide. Uh, but Israel never explicitly uh, uh, was ready to declare that uh, it would not uh, use chemical weapon, it would not develop, uh, and, and uh, would not transfer chemical weapon. Uh, so what I'm saying, Israel say it support the, the, the convention uh, and its purpose, but Israel is not ready to, to declare that it's obliged uh, under uh, the rules of, uh, of the, the chemical uh, uh, weapon, international norms. Uh, so what I try, what I, what I try to thought how to change this uh, this way of uh, discussion, how to to restart the the discussion uh, here in uh, Israel, a, a discussion that got to to some kind of absurdity. Uh, if you look uh, on the situation with the Syrian uh, weapon crisis, Israel uh, uh, public statement was that uh, that. Uh, uh, the Syrian uh, perpetrator that used chemical uh, weapon have to be punished, but not only that, that the Syrian weapon also have to be uh, dis uh, distracted. Uh, but on the other hand, when they ask Israel, okay, what's your position about your uh, uh, claimed uh, chemical weapon, uh, Israel, Israel said that it's not going to change it, its policy. Further than that, this, the the speak, speak, uh, spokesman of the foreign ministry said in uh, in last in uh, October 2013 that Israel is still threatened by chemical weapon and uh, in Israel you can f you can understand it from uh, between the world that Israel still keeping its right to reprisal uh, with chemical weapon. Uh, so. If we talk before about university and universality, there are two ways to get into universality. Uh, the, the first one is if every each state in the world would join the CWC. The other way is uh, if the prohibition in the CWC become international uh, customary law. Uh, 
so what what uh, what didn't reach inside uh, the Israelis discussion is the change that happened in the last 20 years about the international uh, customary law uh, and it's a big change and actually the the chemical uh, weapon crisis in Syria uh, strengthened the the international norm prohibited uh, the the you any use of a chemical weapon in a, under any circumstances in a non-international uh, uh, armed conflict and in a, a international armed conflict and also in reprisal uh, used by, uh, in, by uh, states or by non-states actors. This, this is uh, the way uh, I think uh, most of the, of the international uh, legal, uh, the international law legal experts see it today. Uh, so what I did, I wrote a letter to the Minister of Defense and I asked I, I ask him, okay, Israel don't want to join the, the CWC, Israel don't want to be under the, the, the supervision of OPCW, uh, but still Israel uh, is under the international customary law that, that, that apply to, to Israel and to other uh, non-convention, uh, non, uh, 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 non-party states. Uh, and the answer that I got is uh, is a very vague answer that it's current with uh, Israeli policy in the last uh, 20 years. The answer that I got from a uh, uh, husband Ari is the attorney of the Minister of Defense is that Israel is support the CWC and its principle and this is this was the uh, Israel position uh, uh, from the time of, of that Israel signed the convention. And that Israel is also uh, obliged to the international uh, customary law that apply to her. So I send the second letter to the Minister of Defense and I ask him, I want you to express explicitly that Israel is, uh, is uh, obliged not to, not to use chemical weapon, uh, and not uh, to develop, not to produce, and not to transfer according to the, to the international uh, uh, norm that apply to Israel. And I didn't get any answer from him. So what I did is uh, two weeks ago, I filed a petition to the Israeli High Court, and uh, I asked ask, uh, the court to give an uh, order to the state uh, to declare uh, that it's adherent to, to the international customary uh, law. Uh, and, what, and what I explained in the petition is that uh, I, to, to f I, I don't have any, for, any, any uh, way to force uh, Israel to ratify the, the, the CWC. It's a political uh, decision. Uh, but uh, and I, but I can, I can uh, ask, uh, I can as a citizen ask uh, Israel uh, to declare that it, that it work according to the international customary uh, law. Uh, another thing that I wanted to ease the, the stress in the court is that I said that, that there's a legal, uh, uh, different uh, legal route between uh, nuclear weapon and chemical weapon because we know according to the opinion of the ICJ that the, that the nuclear weapon, is, there, there aren't any uh, international uh, customary law that prohibit uh, the use of chemical weapon. This is, was the opinion of, of the ICJ. But, in, but uh, the chemical weapon got in a different uh, legal route. So I, say, I, told, I told the court, don't worry, it, it, the, this petition won't uh, concern uh, the, the nuclear uh, arsenal, suppose the uh, nuclear arsenal of, uh, of Israel, and another thing I said is that because Israel is, won't, is not a member of the, of the CWC, Israel won't uh, have to admit if it got or doesn't have or doesn't got a chemical weapon. So like what I try to do is to dismantle all the landmine that, uh, that Israel wa wa was afraid all, uh, all, the, all the time along and uh, the court uh, told uh, the state to respond to the petition on the, on the end of December. And to my opinion, it would be very hard uh, to the Minister of Defense or anyone in Israel to say uh, explicitly we, 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 uh, the international customary law uh, doesn't apply uh, us. And, and I, I think it's, it's a good restart because until today, uh, Israel dis the, the Israeli discussion was if it's good to our interest or it's bad to our interest. But the real discussion should be uh, 
if it's good to our interest or bad to our interest, in, in, the, in the situation that this is the international uh, law that apply to us. You can put the international uh, law uh, on the side and not, and not uh, look at it. So maybe uh, because of the petition, if uh, the court decides that uh, Israel is not allowed to use uh, a chemical weapon, Israel won't have much uh, interest uh, in, in not joining the, the CWC, I don't know. But I think it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, restart. Another thing that I hope to achieve with this petition is that I think the, the Israeli people know about, they discuss, they think about the nuclear weapon. Most of the people don't know, don't have any clue about chemical weapon. Uh, they, they don't even, they don't know we have it. They don't know if, if uh, we don't have it. They don't have the, they don't know there is a CWC. They don't, it's not a subject here in uh, Israel. And, uh, and uh, many times uh, a petition to the high court started a dialogue uh, inside Israel. So I hope it, it will also uh, start a, a, a discussion inside uh, the society. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, two interesting uh, positions uh, taken on a variety of issues. And they definitely raise uh, a number of issues, uh, which leads me to three uh, questions now questions? sorry Easy questions. Uh, how good are you at answering <laughs> no the, the the first one uh, really uh, is um, how does your movement interact with the religious community in Israel uh, ve very often in, you know, Western countries, in Europe and so on, uh, there is that elevated belief that, you know, religious communities contribute to uh, the betterment of the world and so forth. But the, the reason why I uh, come to that particular point is that uh, I've done a lot of historical research on the origins of the norm against the use of poison. And I've been able to trace it both in uh, Christianity and in uh, Islam. And actually, the roots of uh, religious interdictions on the use of poison and your reference to uh, indiscriminate weapons is actually the root uh, of those religious uh, injunctions. But in my research, I've never been able uh, to find a, a similar evolution in the Jewish uh, religion. And the explanation I got from uh, Jewish uh, colleagues and friends is uh, the diaspora and the fact that uh, the Jews, for the greatest part of history, never occupied territory which they had to administer. So the real legal... Up. Sorry? Yeah, so, so uh, I was coming to the present. I said uh, the real legal foundations you started getting uh, in terms of uh, weapon use and possession started like in 48 with the establishment of the State of Israel. But ha hav having said that, to what extent is it possible to get certain religious leaders, if there is such a thing in uh, Jewry, to uh, issue kinds of religious eid, sorry? For you too? No, fatwa, it means in Arabic. Yeah, I, I know, I, I know, but I try to avoid using certain words. I mean, uh, after all, I'm not in Europe where I can make mistakes. Uh, no, but uh, to, to get something uh, there, I mean, and I don't want to use the word fatwa because uh, fatwas are not hierarchical in uh, Islam. Whereas I do not know in Christianity, it's very vertical uh, in terms of religion. So I, I don't know how it works uh, with you. But if you were to get certain statements, even if it was only on the issue of chemical weapons, that would be um, a major impediment uh, since the government, <laughs> while it's formally secular, it does look for a lot of religious legitimacy for whatever it uh, does. So is this one way you might be able to go about it. That's a question I have. The second thing is, um, I think you mentioned it uh, briefly in your uh, presentation, but 1540, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1540, uh, is perhaps something to think more deeply about. Because 
in terms of chemical and biological weapons, uh, it has essentially taken over the provisions of the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention and the Chemical Weapons Convention. But 1540 applies to all members of the United Nations, irrespective of whether they are a party to the Chemical Weapons Convention or the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention. What can you exploit in that particular area? The reports are up on the internet of the 1540 committee. You can check these. What has Israel done? What has it reported and so forth? It's a, another area of potential action uh, for civil society. And then the final point is September of last year, the end of September of last year, your president, I, I think he's still your president, Paris. No? Ah, okay. The, so the former president, um, he made a statement in The Hague that if the Syrian disarmament project goes well, this would really be a great incentive for Israel to ratify the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention. <laughs> now, Mr. Peres doesn't strike me as a, a person who wants to go quietly for the remainder of his years. I suppose he has a foundation in his name and uh, whatever. Can you contact these people and see, I mean, he must still have some political impact on the debate here and to have him inside Israel commit to that position. Because today, uh, you know, 15 months, uh, 14, 15 months uh, later, you know, we know at least for 90% that the chemical weapon disarmament in Syria was a success. It's no longer a strategic threat to Israel. We, we still have details we want to know about, but, you know, in essence, that per chemical threat has been eliminated. So. What can you do there in terms of mobilizing public opinion, mobilizing political action, particularly towards the Knesset? Before I let your own uh, answer, I'll just tell you that I tried to contact Paris before this uh, round table, and I just couldn't get through the answering machine, like Paris 5, never-ending stories. <laughs> just because he's no longer the president doesn't mean that it's easy to uh, get hold of him. Um, the, the the working with the religious uh, with with religious uh, figures was something that we wanted to do for a long time. Uh, we even managed to have um, a joint meeting and a meal between rabbis for human rights and the Hibakusha survivors that we brought to Israel. But that was the most we managed to do for now. Uh, it doesn't mean that we will not try and continue to try because. Uh, this is a fantasy to have to find to find uh, some some uh, ways of looking at the Bible and looking at the halacha and find some fatwas about uh, about the, the usage of any WMDs. Um, it's not it's not easy. Uh, also, because Judaism is not something that is very uh, evolving uh, rapidly. Uh, it's it's quite a stagnatized. Uh, Religion about 1540. I'll let Itai answer. I mean, he can answer with the. I just he, he'll answer to all three points. But uh, 1540 will be like. With Paris, there are two uh, two major things. Paris, and I, I don't want to be criticizing him behind his back, but Paris always spoke in two languages: the international language and Hebrew. And in Hebrew is uh, I, I I don't know if he would say the same thing. Uh, he always knew how to sound really, really good in English for the international community, and um, I, I can I can even write his uh, answer to you if I was uh, his speechwriter and said yes when Syria when we'll know for sure when Syria that Syria got rid of all its um, uh, weapons then we'll do it but of course we will never know for sure and and uh, f this is this has been Paris all alone. They don't even bother because they don't have to because Perez didn't have the power to make this statement. He has done it systematically. Even in the government, be because, yeah, I don't know why they, they even bothered to do it in the past. Maybe because in the past he was more powerful or maybe it got more attention. I know that this time it got some uh, attention. Uh, you can always look at, at what are the 
I don't know, maybe Netanyahu thought that for the moment it's not good for him to say anything. Maybe he thought that he's going to gain something from the possibility that he might. Maybe he thought that while Syria is being uh, disarming itself, it's he, he better shut up. I mean, there are lots of reasons why. After a Paris statement, there was a, f- a further statement by Ofer Shelach. Ofer Shelach is a, is a MK and uh, is part of the security and uh, foreign uh, committee. In the Knesset, Foreign Affairs Committee, yeah, and uh, he talked in a, in a INSS uh, conference in last uh, March, and he said uh, that because that actually the destruction of uh, the Syrian uh, chemical weapon strengthened Israel position uh, because the international community uh, sees Israel as a responsible actor. Uh, so this is, I think, the, the last statement of, uh, of the most official uh, Israeli uh, poli- political uh, member. Uh, about decision uh, uh, one, uh, one, uh, 150, 140, uh, this decision and also the decision uh, 2118 and uh, the all the all the, the the things that happen around the, the Syrian uh, weapon uh, for sure uh, strengthen the international uh, uh, norm against any use of uh, of uh, chemical weapon in uh, under any circumstances. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that in in the Israeli court in Israel a uh, political situation we can use the the decision directly. Uh, I don't think that we get a positive response from uh, from the governments if we try to use it directly. But uh, I'm trying to use it uh, in the petition to claim that the international lo- norm uh, got uh, strength. Uh, Yeah, Itai, thanks for the for the explanation on the on the court case, and it's uh, it's just a, a legal question. It's like, what what is the status of a petition? That's it's a no, it's a word that I don't know from my own uh, legal background. Uh, so, uh, and and can you explain again when when this is due in courts? Like, like what is the the timing of uh, of the of the case? The, the Israeli High Court wo- work, it's like the highest uh, legal uh, uh, court in Israel. It's like the Supreme Court in the, in the States. Uh, so it's an administrative uh, petition, and you ask uh, and you p- uh, apply it against an uh, ad- administrative uh, unit in Israel. Uh, so what happens is after, I file a, after you file a petition, then uh, the court decides if to give uh, order against the, the state, uh, but first the state have to respond to the petition. And this is what's really important to me, because even if then this, the court uh, uh, won't agree with my position, it's really important uh, not only for uh, the development of the, of the, of the CWC regime, but it's very important for the Israeli people to get uh, once and for all a, a clear position, a clear statement of Israel. We cannot live uh, with this uh, amb- uh, ambivalency. Uh, uh, we cannot be like that. We cannot uh, do a real discussion uh, when Israel uh, say, ah, we, 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 on one hand we, we support the CWC, but on the other hand we don't we do want to keep the option uh, open. Uh, it's a problem uh, to us uh, as, as citizens. Like I, I think, I think that. Most people don't, as I said, don't know any, any, have any clue about chemical weapons. But if they knew, I believe that most of the Israeli people would be against any kind of use of uh, chemical uh, weapons. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. I have a question to you about uh, the Iranian nuclear program. As we are approaching the 24th of November, do you see that reaching an agreement with Iran, even if it's not a final one or a principal agreement, can can like soften the Israeli position, which I doubt, of course. So, 
and uh, how can Israel like justify its position after the destruction of chem Syrian chemical weapons and then after hopefully resolving the Iranian nuclear issue how can it keep like uh, being like away from uh, these issues, the disarmament. We know, you know, of course, that Egypt is very interested in this issue, and we are taking lots of steps in order to to implement a WMD free zone, and we want to uh, to have to ho the conference of 2012, as uh, Sharon mentioned, to be held before the next review conference. And I think, for in that regard, that uh, the facilitator will come to the region next week. He will come to Egypt, then he will come to Israel, in order to convince the prime minister if he's going to uh, to meet him or. Uh, maybe at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the uh, officials, to uh, be more flexible in that issue because uh, they cannot like uh, stay away for too long. Thank you. Diana, as you know, we are not representing the government. We can only guess what the government will say. And my guess is, and I'll be the government now, is how do you want us to talk about the most secret of secrets of the weapons that keeps us all safe without talking about regional security? We're not part of the NPT, then therefore we don't have to abide to the NPT. This decision was made at the NPT, and we don't have any rush. First, let's talk about regional security, and then let's talk about that. Now about the Iranian issue. We don't trust, we the government, the, uh, this deal. We think that this deal is only to uh, allow the United States to work with Iran against ISIS. At the same time, we'll allow Iran to keep building nuclear weapons, or at least the ability to build nuclear weapons. All of these concerns, by the way, are real concerns, and that's me, uh, Sharon, not the government. Um, all of these concerns we can understand. However, as civil society, uh, I think and I believe that all of these concerns can be worked on while we are working together on a WMD free zone, uh, especially since the Iranian have always been pro the WMD free zone process, have come to the decisions, not to mention that in 1974 it was the Iranians that came up with the idea of a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East with Egypt. Uh, so it all can be solved if there's goodwill. And for now there's lack of goodwill, and when there's no goodwill you find all the excuses, and sometimes you really believe in these excuses. I don't think that it's just lies. I think that, that some of them really believe in these excuses, and we will continue to believe in these excuses because they're used to it, because they're not being challenged by civil society and other way of thinking. I think you, you could see the development in Israel's statement, like now uh, in, in uh, the official statement, they put more uh, emphasizing on uh, non-state actors. And what it tells us is like if every state uh, in the region in the world join all the uh, D, uh, M, uh, WMD uh, treaties, still Israel would be threatened by uh, non-state actors. So this 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 uh, leave open uh, the Israel uh, position forever uh, because you don't state non-state actor cannot join the the international uh, treaties. So like Sharon said, uh, you need uh, good will. If not, you, you're going, you always uh, will have uh, an excuses. And it's really important to say that there's no discussion in Israel, nothing. So it's, it would be interesting to see how the Israeli government uh, react when there is even a small uh, uh, discussion in the, the public. Because now there's a total uh, taboo. Uh, nobody is talking about that. The, on, the only uh, news that I saw on uh, Israel nuclear uh, weapons uh, on the on the periphery of it, uh, the, the, uh, there was an article in the Israeli uh, news uh, Mariv that said that uh, uh, the research center near Dimona uh, for for nuclear uh, had to pay uh, Arnona. Taxes to the to the municipality of Dimona. I think this was the the only uh, the only art news article that I saw about it in uh, in ages. Two very brief comments and one question. The brief comment is that I would say not to give up on former President Paris. Uh, when he before he became president, he came as a guest of uh, 
the Israeli branch of IPPNW to a conference in Tel Aviv University, and he knows exactly what the positions of IPPNW are. And he came and he spoke, and he has given all sorts of hints about a more constructive position than the fact that he was the original father of the Israeli nuclear program as well. So he definitely, I think he gave a very good speech at the Haaretz Peace Conference on July 8th. I also felt he gave a very good speech at the Rabin Memorial Conference. He is somebody that we can work with in theory, if we reach him, who also uh, has still impact on Israeli public opinion. In terms of religion, uh, Jean Pascal, you raised the question of finding a religious figure. We have a major problem here that the people who dominate religion here are the conservative orthodox. And among them, it will be very difficult to find someone who will be ready to say a halachic or fatwa or whatever we want to call it that will go in our direction. Uh, perhaps we have to look in the direction of the conservative <coughs> and the reform who are here, but definitely there are major uh, rabbinical figures abroad, and perhaps that should be considered as well. And then I come to my simple question, not being a lawyer, uh, you mentioned a number of times international customary law. What exactly does that mean? Where do we find all of these laws collected so that we can refer to them? I think the, the easiest place to find them, if I don't go inside the legal uh, explanation, is to look in the ICRC, the, the Red Cross uh, Humanitarian uh, uh, Law Guide. They, they did a big, uh, big research that identified uh, 166 uh, customary laws. Uh, and, uh, and, they, uh, and they, after the, the research, they decided the, that there is a customary law that prohibits the use of a chemical weapon uh, in an in international armed conflict or in non-international uh, armed conflict. And also that, uh, that there is a customary law that, that uh, prohibits the, the use of, uh, of riot agent in a, in a method of warfare. Uh, so this is the easiest uh, for, for a people, the person that don't understand. What, one, more, one more sentence is what, what you check is the state practice, and you, you check the, the state opinion. Uh, uh, and uh, if now that we have 190 uh, state that signed and ratified the, the CWC, uh, it's thing that uh, I want to give a little bit an anecdote. When I, I, I did the research for my, uh, from, uh, the petition, I went to the Israeli law libraries. And most of the, the books were from uh, year uh, 94. Like this, the, the, all, the, all the, the legal discussion even is not, is not uh, uh, according to what's happened outside. Uh, so, so we have to check the state practice. And, uh, and we see that even now in the Syrian crisis, uh, uh, no, I, I, there was not even one state that said that uh, Syria wa had a right to keep it uh, to keep its uh, its uh, chemical weapon or to do a use uh, any use uh, with them. So you you check the the, the state uh, statements and you check the state uh, practice, and this is the way you you get to it. And in Israel, like any uh, country in the world, is obliged. Uh, to, to this uh, customary uh, uh, principle. Uh, and also, Israel has, Israel has an uh, obligation because it's a signatory uh, state to the CWC. Israel, because it's a signatory state, cannot do things that, that uh, damage the purpose and the target of the, of the CWC. Uh, Quick clarification on that. Um, do they have to, does Israel have to be a signatory to the, Vienna, uh, the, the treaty on treaties, as it were, isn't there a Vienna Convention on Treaties? So uh, if, if, if Israel were a member of that, then they would have to abide by the spirit of the CWC having signed it. But is, it, is Israel a, a member of that treaty on treaties, as it were? Oh, good. Thank you. I just looked at the clock. I realize we're about an hour over our schedule. Uh, and I know a lot of people are getting tired <coughs> uh, around the table. <laughs> so um, 
uh, I'll just say thank you to everybody. I think this is a really helpful, very lively uh, discussion, a variety of discussions today. And I think it's generated a lot of very good ideas. Thank you. The petition tie is a very good idea. I think uh, Jean Pascal's mention of uh, 1540, UN Security Council 1540, in which all members of the United Nations <coughs> are obliged to to promote you know, non-proliferation and disarmament of, of weapons of mass destruction. Nuclear, chemical, and biological has implications for the nuclear powers a lot as well. The United States, the P5, and the like, and certainly Pakistan and India, uh, and, uh, and North Korea as well. Um, and I think, uh, Sharon, your recommendation that we think about maybe an NGO petition of some type or statement uh, of some type, we can certainly we can certainly do that. I mean, the letter the letter that we did, Lenny and I and and eighteen or twenty others who wrote we wrote to Secretary of State John Kerry and U.S. Secretary of Defense uh, Chuck Hagel around ways to try to help facilitate and bring more transparency and understanding to the uh, Syrian chemical weapons destruction program garnered actually a lot of press. Um, sadly, the U.S. State Department or Defense Department never formally responded to us. I had plenty of phone calls, actually, people very worried about it, and if we had released us the press or not, and all sorts of things. Um, but in fact, there was never any formal response. Uh, but I had, it elicited enormous, an enormous number of conversations with high-level ranking officials who I think were trying to do the right thing but just couldn't, couldn't get it together in time. And also because the political complexities of the, between the United Nations, the OPSW, the United States, and some of the state's parties, uh, the Russians, the Italians, and others, <clears throat> it was just really a complicated political situation to do anything in a, in a month or two. Um, so I think we should just more brainstorm tomorrow on what we might do from here. Uh, our CWC coalition you know, has about 150 NGOs uh, all over the world as a member of it now. And each of those NGOs have a lot of fellow NGOs as well. Um, the, other, the other thought, too, is the uh, Right Livelihood uh, Award Foundation, of which some of you know I'm, I'm a member now, having received the, the award last year in, in Stockholm. That has 155, uh, or maybe it's even more than 158, uh, really renowned laureates from all over the world. Uh, a variety of areas, not just arms control and the science. Mostly it's human rights, it's peace and justice. One of my fellow laureates last year was Raji Sirani, who you may know, well-known human rights lawyer in, in Gaza, and uh, who's been in the news recently. But I think we could get um, some of those too if we wanted to uh, sign on board. We also, uh, we're also one of the founders of something called the Fizzle Material Working Group. FMWG, it's called in Washington, D.C. It's headquartered in Washington, but it's, a, it's an effort of a, about 100 uh, NGOs around the world to promote non-proliferation and uh, control of fissile material, particularly high-enriched uranium, plutonium, uh, but also LEU, low-enriched uranium, and radioactive sources as well, and promote and support the uh, nuclear security summits. And we could probably get some signers from there. Uh, as well, even though most of them don't deal with chemical weapons, uh, they're certainly supportive of all the work we do. So, I guess I'll leave it at that. I know, um, I know we some of us have a dinner tonight um, at seven. Is it? We'll meet in the lobby at seven, and then we begin again tomorrow morning uh, at nine thirty, I believe, according to the schedule. So, uh, I assume same same place here and here. So, I just want to thank. Uh, Thank you, Sharon, and thank all your colleagues and, and Mosi as well um, for hosting us here today and, and organizing it so well, too, with food and good company and, uh, and good active support. So thank you.